would be the place where we would hope that a lot of that stuff would be documented. Uh, a lot of the correspondence and letters and things might be here. All my stuff, I've told them here, you can have all my stuff. And you know, I made the MDMA that Rick D Dobbin uses in all of his studies, and I made the DNT for Rick Strassman and the psilocybin for Johns Hopkins. And I've got all the records and documents from where we made that and the paperwork and the early correspondence. I correspond with Sasha Shogun for 20, 25 years, and I've got copies of correspondence back in the days before email, you know, carbon copies of letters and things. So there's a lot of that kind of stuff. We're basically trying to track it down. It's pretty hard. If people have a collection that they think is valuable, they really don't want to part with it, um, or you know, they say, "Well, I'm not ready to, I'm not ready to do anything yet." I, a good friend of mine was Bet Betty Eisner, and I know she had a big collection. And she unfortunately died before the Purdue archives started, but had she lived and those archives were uh, were they going then, I think she, um, I'm fact, in fact, I'm absolutely positive she would have donated her things to the archive. But unfortunately, she died, and so everything went to UCLA, which was her closest affiliation. And a lot of people, uh, Danny Friedman was one of the very early clinical researchers with LSD, and Rick Strassman and I both worked closely with him, and Rick Strassman's study were good friends. He was actually from uh, Crawford Zoo, Indiana, about 30 miles south of where Purdue is. And I think probably if he'd been alive when the archives were started, we probably could have gotten uh, his research papers donated here, but they've all gone into the UCLA library and are probably in boxes in the basement somewhere. So we've missed out on a lot of stuff that we wish we had. But those are the kinds of things we'd like to get. And anybody who is aware of where somebody might have a collection like that, uh, we'd, I'm sure we'd love to have it here. Is there any way for you to petition UCLA to get that stuff included in the library so that it's protected? Well, and it, it turns out that uh, archivists are, I think, sort of hoarders. Maybe that's the word. Once, <laughs> they, once they get something in their collection, even if they don't do anything with it, they they don't want to let it go. Um, and so the situation we're probably going to be faced with is if we want to get into that, and eventually if we get enough money, the archives right now don't have the money to do that, but to send somebody out, say, and spend a year out there going through the collection and uh, helping them uh, separate it into different categories and then possibly borrowing those collections and digitizing them, and then, but leaving them there so that the information will be online, uh, digitally online. Most of these places, I really doubt that UCLA, for example, is going to uh, digitize uh, Friedman's papers, and I don't. Stanford is not going to uh, digitize Betty Eisner's papers. They're just sitting there in boxes, probably associated with Betty Eisner's effects. So we probably are going to have to, hopefully, get to a situation where we could actually go and have somebody spend time out there and look through it and bring things, either digitize them there, bring them here, digitize them, and then send them back. That's probably the way it's going to have to work. Albert Hoffman has, you know, a bunch of correspondence, and I we talked to him at the time. He was very adamant that it was going to go to some university in Basel. And uh, we even tried to do a life interview with him, and he said he was tired of interviews. He wasn't going to do more interviews. We caught him really too late in life. The archives really didn't get started quickly enough. But uh, there again is a case where maybe they'll do something with his materials in Basel, but uh, you know, most libraries don't have a lot of money for extra uh, projects like that unless somebody gives it to them. So we may have to send somebody over and work with them, put some money into it to help them uh, get digitized. And so you know, the archives, uh, that's a good idea. Um, we unfortunately probably got started a little later than would have been optimal to get a lot of those collections. And uh, if things really got rolling and, and we had more money going into the special collections, you know, we could probably they could probably afford to send someone out to do some of this digitization. It would be nice to have it all online. It would to, you could dial up someplace and say, okay, you know, you could look under somebody's name and click on it, and it would show all the categories of things. I mean, there are things like that now, online and categorized, but uh, we don't have as many as as I wish we had. I really would like it to be a central place. And the point we try to make with people when they get when they you know, offer a little pushback or reluctance, say, look. This is going to be in perpetuity. You know, your your stuff is going to be here in perpetuity. You're not losing anything, and this is you know these things are going to be stuck in an attic somewhere. And you know, Arthur Hefter, uh, his family. I talked to one of his great great granddaughters or great 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 granddaughters. I can't remember which. Um, she, Catherine Schneider is a is an anesthesiologist in Germany, and she says she's got an uncle and he's got a whole bunch of records and notebooks and pictures that belong to Arthur Hefter. Um, I haven't been able to reach her 
raised her on email lately. I don't know where she's changed addresses up, but we'd really like to get a lot of that stuff and get it digitized. And her uncle has digitized some of it. In fact, some of the photographs on the Hefter site we got through uh, his granddaughter, her great-granddaughter. But we'd like to have stuff like that actually in the archive and preserved because they have temperature control up there. You have old books and documents that are going to yellow and fall apart well, if they're just kept in some uncle's trunk in the attic. And they could be preserved here and kept in a state of, you know, where they'd always be available for, for hundreds of years, assuming you know, our culture <laughs> remains for hundreds of years. Yeah, you know, and that's been the the one concern of of mine when I think about the project as well. And one thing that actually inspired this interview project that I've been working on and just wrapping up now after t nearly two years has been the Purdue project because, uh, you know, my goal with this was to create an overview of the field of psychedelic studies by interviewing many of the leading psychedelic researchers out there. So between you and Tom Roberts and Robert Forty and a couple of others, between, you know, that's really what inspired this entire interview project to begin with. Well, hopefully we can get a copy of whatever the final, your final product is for the archives. Oh, absolutely. Everything that I've been doing has been going in there, and I'll be making sure that you guys get a hard copy as well as uh, uh, copies of the actual interviews. You know, of course, the printed versions, the, the ones that everybody has approved for final publication will be the ones that I think make it out to the general masses, but we'll make sure that uh, the archives have, have a copy of everybody's audio as well. Right, that's good, yeah. They've also got some life what uh, life histories or uh, oral histories. Uh, Stan Groth came and did an interview. I've done one. Uh, Bill Richards has done one. Maurice Rapport, who people say, Maurice Rapport, who's that? He's the guy who discovered serotonin. And that's the basis for how all these work. We have a, and he's, he's, he's very old. He's blind and, and kind of almost enfeebled now. We got his life history a couple years ago. So they're doing some of that too. So audios and tapes and DVDs. Uh, all those things are being collected. What can you tell us about intactogens and your research with MDMA, the chemistry, your ability to be one of the few people actually being allowed to manufacture these things as well? Yeah, the um, well, the the, manif the uh, MDMA that I manufactured was actually made prior to its scheduling. Rick Doblin wanted to, of course, his one of his primary goals, if not sole goal for a long time, was to make MDMA into a medicine. And he needed to get uh, preclinical toxicology, two years of preclinical toxicology. And he shopped around to find out if anybody could make MDMA to GMP, was good manufacturing practices standards, basically, you know, FDA drug quality material. Nobody would touch it. And uh, he called me and he said, you know, could you do this? And so we looked at it, and I want, and I've always been, I've always tried to do things to move this field along. And I said, Yeah, I think so. And he put me in touch with an FDA chemist, and and the chemist said, Well, no, these are the things you need to do. You need to keep a record of this and some of this stuff. And so I worked with the FDA chemist, and we made material that's 99.98 percent pure, whatever, and double distilled the free base and recrystallized the hydrochloride salt, and so that was all done. Then. When, the, when, it, when it became a controlled substance, uh, once the drug is a controlled substance, I don't have a manufacturer's license, I have a researcher's license. So the only way you can do it as a researcher is if you are part of a research project and you do it in the context of contributing to the project. So with Strassman and with Griffiths, uh, that, those were the cases. So they made it, uh, made it legally possible to do that. Um, but MDMA, I became aware of it in the 70s. Sasha Shogun had told me about it uh, back in the 70s and, and, and said, you know, there's a number of people out here starting to use it in therapy. And um, there was a meeting in Esalen in the fall of 84 uh, that a lot of people who had been uh, using and, and uh, promoting MDMA uh, were there. And as one, I had published, I did the first pharmacology on MDMA in 1982 before anybody called it ecstasy or knew what it was. We published it, and it's in a paper with a lot of other compounds. So we sort of, I knew more about how it worked as a serotonin releaser. I was the one who first showed that it was a serotonin releaser, and 
So they invited me as a scientist who'd worked in the field. And I talked to some of these psychiatrists who had used it, and they had these amazing tales of you know, therapeutic breakthroughs. And I said, wow, this is amazing. This, maybe this stuff is really going to be useful. But I also, as a pragmatist, thought this stuff is never going to make it to the market because it had its genesis in the recreational drug scene. And uh, I still think uh, that the probability of MDMA becoming a legitimate licensed drug is very remote unless uh, Doblin does a study with a huge number of, uh, say, war veterans who come back from Iraq and Afghanistan with PTSD and shows the same kind of success he has in this, in this small study. Then I think it will be used specifically maybe for that. And I don't know, I don't know how that the regulation would work because once a drug is, in a, is a controlled substance, in Schedule One especially, moving it out of Schedule One uh, is imperative for it to be used medically. And it's extremely difficult because one of the prongs for that test is a recognized medical use. And you can do a clinical study like the patients that they did in South Carolina, the MDMA PTSD patients, I think 19 patients. That, even though it works, it's not accepted as, a, as medically proven. You have to do study after study, and no one really knows where the point is where you can say, well, now it's accepted as a medical use. Well, it's... Uh for instance, it's like medical mar medical marijuana, where they have now, I believe, normal estimates on their website that it's the most studied substance out there, with twenty thousand plus published studies on it, and thirteen states now using it for medical use, and the FDA still refuses to approve it. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a situation of like, where is that line between now it's accepted medical use? And so this is, and of course you have a lot more people using MDMA, uh, using marijuana in that way, in medical marijuana, than you have using MDMA. So you you have that problem. So I recognized that problem, and I said, boy, you know, this stuff is never going to get out there. And at that time, the DEA was calling it just another substituted hallucinogenic amphetamine. And I said, you know, this doesn't make sense to me, because hallucinogenic amphetamines don't have this and methyl it's a, it's a substitute methamphetamine, right? Methylene doxy, methamphetamine. That meth, you put that on something like mescaline or, or 2CI, 2CB, DOB, any of the standard psychedelics, it kills their activity. And yet MDMA had activity, and I said, you know, something's not right here. So I made the enantiomers. MDMA has two isomers, a plus and minus isomer. So I made the two isomers and sent samples of them to Sasha Shulgin, who did human studies back then. And then we did a lot of pharmacology, and we showed that it was the plus isomer that was active. And a lot of people have done that, those studies since, to see that's the plus isomer. Well, with the psychedelic amphetamines, like DOB or things like that, it's the minus isomer. So now we said, hmm, it's the N-methyl. That's not supposed to be there in the psychedelic amphetamines. And it should be the minus isomer if it was a psychedelic amphetamine, but it's not. It's a plus isomer. And I thought, there, there, maybe there, is there any other way we could test that? Well, it turns out many years ago that Sasha Shogun had taken a compound called DOM or STP, and it has an alpha methyl, a single carbon attached to the side chain, and he had put a two carbon ethyl group attached it instead of the single carbon methyl, and it completely loses its psychedelic effects. And a, a major pharmaceutical company. Uh, Sasha had said, you know, I think it might be an antidepressant. A major pharmaceutical company had made this compound and taken it into clinical trials and uh, had overdosed one of the subjects, an elderly patient, and I can't remember the dose she was given, something like 400 milligrams. It was a huge dose, and there were no psychedelic effects. Well, d you know, DOMSTP, 5 to 10 milligrams is an effective dose. So this, this patient had gotten hundreds of milligrams with no effect. So by adding this alpha F 